<laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone out in virtual reality. Uh, I'm Michael Naylor, and uh, I'm the director of the Maine Enneagram Center for Transformation and Change, and uh, here today to do uh, another interview. Um, I've been doing these for well, over three years and always find them uh, so uh, educational for me and just uh, going beneath the stereotypes of the types and into the soul of the human being. So today I, we have uh, Seth uh, is here representing the, uh, uh, the world of the type nine as he's been navigating it. And uh, so I just want to welcome you uh, and looking forward to hear about, uh, you know, your journey and the work you do. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I just um, glad to have you here and, and just jump in and take us on your your ride to, uh, through the labyrinth of type nine and, uh -huh. and the work you do and all of that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Thank you for having me, Michael. Um, yeah. Um, I'm I'm very grateful to be here. Um, I'm I'm doing the some of the hard work at the moment of trying to locate myself so that I can communicate from a place of, of presence rather than, you know, of forgetting what's valuable to me. So, um, yeah, as Good. I pause and I, I take a little bit of a deeper breath here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because speaking about myself can be a little tricky and I can tend to parrot as well things that I, that I know about rather than kind of give you an experience of what's here right now. So, um, yeah, so um, I I am I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I'm originally uh, I, I'm a musician uh, by trade first. That's what I did for most of my life, and then you know as as life uh, continued to happen and more responsibility comes into my life, I have uh, four kids. I've been married for 13 years, and so you know as that responsibility kept on building, um, I've never been a, a person of of managing a business and that's really what it is to to be an artist and to try and make a career uh, i'm managing my seth abram what it means to be an artist and that was never my skill set so i kind of made the decision to get a uh, uh a different job um and you know started cultivating different skill sets uh, which was wild to me because i always had assumed myself to be you know um little old singer songwriter seth abram uh so i you know the uh, kind of the pain of 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 some of life forced me into um, starting to look for what else, what other capacity was here. Um, so basically, what uh, long story short, what I what I kind of do now is a handful of things. You know, I'm a dad, like I said. Um, that's first and foremost what's most important to me. And you know, they my kids are my greatest teachers. Uh, they mirror back to me everything. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I said this the other day. I don't know if you're familiar with those those uh, those bracelets WWJD that were popular back in the '90s. Uh, what would Jesus do? I want to get them made with my kids' initials in them. Uh, what would Athen do? He's my six-year-old son, and then life would be so much more exhilarating and fun and wild and and curious, you know. Um, mm. Anyway, my kids are my greatest teachers, is the point. But um, so what I do uh, in Nashville at this point. Um, uh, you know, I was a musician for a long time, and then I actually worked as a pastor for a couple of years. And now I work for a nonprofit organization um, called Restore Small Groups, and it's it's basically an organization that provides um, peer to peer support groups to help people process their story and implement positive life change. And we kind of create um, a sacred, safe space for people to be fully known and process the mm. pain of their the, their universal con human condition. Mm, awesome. Yeah, awesome. and then I do some coaching on the side and some some music as well still, and yeah, all the all the different things. And then you know, uh, I met you through uh, an invitation to be on your podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So say say a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so at the height, really at the start of the the pandemic, um, two friends and I, two really good friends, a guy named Drew Mosier and another guy named Seth Creekmore. Um, uh, they're both located in Indiana. Uh, we have done a lot of life together uh, and in different seasons. And and they had the idea of, hey, what if we uh, started an Enneagram podcast since we're at home doing you know nothing and we can't leave? And I think I had a lot of actual resistance to it at first, um, but somehow was won over. And yeah, we started that thing in 2020 and went on the journey of, of uh, trying to bring in lots of... of um, 
voices that represented more of an expansive expression of the Enneagram. And, and yours was yours was one. Um, mm. And still, it's one of the first time we had you on was one of my favorite conversations we've had. Not to just say that because I'm on <laughs> yours now, but it really was. It really was. So mm. okay. it's called oh, it's called Fathoms, like the depths, Fathoms yeah, and Enneagram yeah. podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, beautiful. So um, can you say a little bit about, you know, how you discovered the Enneagram and, and, and how your journey with that particular uh, tool of inquiry uh, started and, and where how it's been? Yeah. Um, so I probably heard about it initially over 10 years ago now. Um, I had never really gotten in, interested in any kind of personalities, anything before. Um, so how it was initially presented to me in this this home was, you're this, and uh, these are your behaviors. And I felt like I'm being put in a box. I don't like that. That's uh, so forget it. Uh, I just was turned off right away. Uh, and then you know I just um, back then I had a bit of a different uh, outlook on you know just the symbols that were that were showing up as the enneagram. You know, and I was like, well, that doesn't seem. Uh, like something I should hold, um, but you know, my I've I've grown a lot since then, and a whole different views, and and uh, so probably around six or seven years ago, now I uh, uh, found myself somebody paid for me to go attend an Enneagram event here hmm. in Nashville, and so I I showed up to that reluctantly, and I just remember the second day sitting in the middle of this room, and it just hitting me like I, I think I'm gonna do something with this the rest of my life. Mm. Because it was so striking, because it named, you know, as a lot of people tend to say, right, it named something so true of me um, that I thought I had covered up, um, that I didn't, that, you know, I felt exposed. But mm -hmm. also, even more so, why I, I knew I wanted to take it from there and do something with it the rest of my life was because what what it was doing for me in that moment was it was helping me see that I had potentially... I. Um, limited myself to a very, very small capacity. Mm. And so I began to be kind of taken over by this idea of what else am I capable of? Mm. What mm. can I do? What else can I become? What else is here? What have I disowned in myself that I'm unaware of that I can reintegrate and become more whole with? And and so mm. that's that's where the why the Enneagram became so important for me six or seven years ago. And um when you, you know, were wrestling with and coming to uh, seeing your type mm -hmm. and maybe seeing things you hadn't quite seen before uh, that were articulated about the type, like what, what were the kind of uh, sort of wake ups that you had regarding your patterns? Yeah. I would say... Um um, you know, this um, sort of diffusing my attention um, so as to not know what is valuable and important to me mm -hmm. um, was a very common um, sort of coping mechanism um, in that, especially in um, around other people, um, I found myself, um, yeah, not, not knowing what I valued. Uh, it was very, it was very difficult. And that was something that was named um, in that, in that setting, but also, um, um, this this quality of kind of a an unwillingness to feel things too deeply mm -hmm. definitely named something about me. I, I've ex, I've sort of said in the past that life feels like um, the intensity of life hits me or it hits first this invisible wall, and I sort of feel this small affect, and so that's how I kind of express in the world. That's how I can express, mm -hmm. and so a lot of like my um, practices in, in the past have been to you know, uh, sort of practice being expressive, overly expressive to see what that feels like, to see what else is here, you know. But, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of times in, in certain arguments in the past, uh, uh, people would say, do you even care about the topic we're talking about? Because I can't <laughs> tell. Does this matter to you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, there's, that's another aspect. Um, I'm sure there's, there's plenty more. You know, I mean, a lot of what has what set me early on into therapy was and uh, like for my wife and I would would be she would bring up, you know, I don't feel like he's showing up. There's a quality of of like 
Um, I can't tell if he's if he's here and this if if this matters to him and and what it looks like and and for me that was just naming. Um, you know, I, I think uh, a common understanding of type nine is that we're afraid of conflict. But I think personally, experientially, there's something even more core to that mm. in that what I'm more afraid of than conflict is the significance that I have to bear and oh. um, and mm. embody in order to face regular life or anything that feels conflictual. Interesting. Well, that, that's a great, uh, great insight. So um, I uh, imagine it, it. It's like if I, if I, you know, sense who I am and what I want, then there's like this heavy load I must, you know, now act upon and carry out into the world. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and so that's interesting. Uh, it's like uh, a different sort of different take on it, uh, and which is great. I, I, that's what I really appreciate about hearing from the types. But um, so uh, when you started to sort of become better at sensing who and what you wanted and you know, uh, uh, started to, you know, trust it would be okay for you to be the significant being that you are. Mm -hmm. um, and I know this is a, a work in progress, but uh, what, what, what did you notice? What was that like for you to begin, you know, trying to show up? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell I'll tell a story that can maybe kind of help encapsulate this. Um, so, my wife and I have, like I said, four kids. And, but our, our the first pregnancy we had, it, it was it was a loss. It was a miscarriage, mm -hmm. and um, this was probably eleven eleven years ago or so now. And you know, it was a very different version of myself than I am today. But I remember, you know, being in that that room where we found out and it was so um deeply painful and mm -hmm. i didn't know how to experience pain at that mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. all i all i knew was that um you know my defense mechanism shut this down mm -hmm. this is too much this is overwhelming mm -hmm. the amount of disappointment if i was to feel an ounce of this mm -hmm. it would it would come it would completely consume me and and so i just remember uh it was con i was confused in the moment of finding out this information and it and it took me until we walked into the parking lot where i had to kind of I, I was so like dropped out of the experience that i had to ask my wife is this what they call a miscarriage is this is that what happened hmm. I, it was like i was trying to still wrap my brain around the reality of this situation hmm. of of the loss and and it, yeah, it was, I was just so distanced from experiencing it because there was nothing here personally to, mm -hmm. to experiencing it with, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah and yeah. so, and so fast forward a couple of years after that, um, we have at that point, this point we have two kids and we are going into that same exact room mm -hmm. where we find out, you know, we're pregnant again. And this is a scary room at this point where what kind of news are we going to get? Mm. And so I just remember, that, you know, the, the intelligence of my psyche is beginning to try to keep me safe by, you know, helping me drop out so I don't feel this too much. Mm -hmm. And I was aware of it this time. Mm. So as I'm, I'm walking into the hospital, I'm noticing it because I'm meeting my wife. We were working at different places and and I'm walking into the hallway and I'm and it's very clear to me. I there's some uh, helpful intelligence of defense here, but I'm. I need to feel this and I need to go into this um, just heart open, whatever happens. And I, and, and so I had to say out loud and I, and I said it clearly, confidently. And I said, this is mine. Hmm. I had to say that, you know, out yeah. loud to make sure this moment with whatever it entails, pain hmm. or deep uh, joy, because that's hmm. even too much to bear sometimes. Mm hmm. I knew either way, whatever direction this was, I had to be fully here to feel all of it. Yeah. Because this that's my responsibility as a dad, but it's also my responsibility as a husband and my responsibility is as just me taking care of myself. So I, I went into that room 
and we found out good news. And if I, you know, if I wouldn't have been fully present like I was, I don't think I would have been as excited. And it was so, it was overwhelming in a good way this time. So that's, awesome. that's an example of. It's a beautiful um, story. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of what uh, one of my nine friends said, is that I, I have this habit of trying to have a, a uh, uh, sort of a band, of, a bandwidth uh, that's controllable of what I, of whatever, so things don't get too intense. It's like I, I don't want to go too high, I don't want to go too low. I want to stay right in the middle there because for whatever reasons, the increased intensity seems to uh, strike a, a, a chord of fear in me. And, and some nines would say, well, it's a, a fear I'm going to, you know, everything's going to unravel and I'm not going to have peace and I won't have control, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. But they, they're, you know, not only do I try to keep you toned down when you're coming towards me, but I try to keep myself toned down so I don't overwhelm myself. So it sounds yeah. like there's bits and pieces of that that you experience. Yeah. yeah, and I would say for me that had to do with embodying my regular human significance. Yes. Because that feels overwhelmingly so much effort. So I, at my like most unhealthy in the past, I just to even wake up to be a person, it means to be significant and make choices yeah. and have opinions. But you have to be a significant person that's present to do that. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, and sometimes the inner critic of the nine is one of the guardians of making sure you don't become significant or embody that, which is... Mm -hmm. saying you're not significant you you don't you're not that important you yeah. should, uh so yeah it, it, i i used to um and i can still definitely do this but i used to project so all of my significance onto stronger people so all my friends were these people that i wish i was like that were amazing yeah. you know like mm -hmm. the the kind of uh golden shadow the light part mm -hmm. of the shadow if you will yeah 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 that and i've noticed that uh that kind of idealizing the other and um i had one of my dear friends with the nine and he, he kept idealizing my uh capacity to teach the enneagram and but mm. he was so gifted at understanding the enneagram i said you know fred you know this as well as i do what why aren't you up here teaching too and right and it's like no, no, I think it's in your hands. So there's just that sort of, uh, and, and there, you know, there's uh, a double edge to that too, I think, is nines are often very good at seeing the best in others and calling it forward. And, you know, when I'm healthy, I notice it in myself and I come forward too and join the party. So, um, so in terms of, you know, sort of getting in touch with what you wish for and what you want, um, how has that evolved? I mean, how... You know, you've talked about, you know, you're starting, you've started embodying, feeling, sensing your significance. I'm really here. Um, and, and so I'm, I wonder if you could say a little bit about how that's unfolded for you. Yeah, I appreciate that question. Um, uh, you know, I started the conversation with, um, I've, I've learned to figure out how to locate myself. I used to say, the more of me I give away, the less of me there is. Mm -hmm. And you know this this sort of focus attention a focus of attention that we have on other people and other, what's valuable to other people is what tends to cloud my ability to know what's important to me uh, because mine could be in opposition to you or it could overshadow you or you know mm -hmm. I want you to feel accepted mm -hmm. um, more than me everyone is always more important um, mm -hmm. but that that meant at least in the beginning, I think the first part of the process meant I have to distance, physically distance myself from people. <laughs> I have to start my day um, because my regular automatic habit is to lose myself immediately with others. Great. Um, yeah. So I have to first locate a part of myself that is grounded so that I can have something that I'm holding first before I'm with other people. Yeah. Um, and you know, one of the most important things for me, and I would say that would be having located a significant part of me. That's what that's what that means. Locating something in me that is significant. Um, and could you uh, mm -hmm. name that, or like, uh, is that a quality of being, or is a 
is it a sensation or what how do you yeah um it, i think it is um experiential in that it's 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 about so i pra i started about a two two years ago a, a, a very early morning um routine because i have again i have a lot of children and you know they wake up early <laughs> yes, they and and i find that if i you know i well let me let me back up and say you know uh w when we had our third child this was in the midst of the pandemic and i i felt like i lost myself in all the roles of what it meant you know i was playing all the roles at the same time in the same space in at my house mm. and it, it was very difficult and and then we found out you know it was not on purpose we found out we were having a fourth child and I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, I lost myself the last time we had a child. Mm -hmm. What is it going to mean? How am I going to manage the amount of responsibility of, of four kids? And I, I just knew um, that I needed to cultivate 3.0 Seth <laughs> if I was going to figure this out. And it, I know you're familiar with um, like just... Uh, I think I'm getting this right, the Gurdjieffian kind of theory of shocks. And this was a shock. This is a major <laughs> shock. Mm -hmm. But along with it, innately came this kind of um, uh, am new ambition and energy for what else could be, what could happen, and what um, what what else is here. So I, I started to like see a vision for myself of who I wanted to become. Mm -hmm. Um and I would say, you know, a lot of nineness is we are externally motivated mm -hmm. by things, but that doesn't that doesn't help me like maintain change in the world or for myself. So in this mm. moment, I've had to find an intrinsic motivation about who I wanted to become. Mm. Um, and and so I I started waking up at four thirty in the morning, mm -hmm. so that I could first attend to my physicality. Uh, so I would go to the gym very first thing um which is very very difficult the first three or four months um <laughs> and I, I i've said before like especially when i am exerting myself physically that is when i am experientially kind of getting a sense for what i'm capable of mm -hmm. so when i start with like showing a level of extreme exertion mm -hmm. i feel my potential happening and i can keep going that's it's kind of like working with the inertia idea that we yeah. can get caught up in. But then I come home and I and I read for 30 minutes with coffee so that I'm you know I'm starting to get more awake. <laughs> and but that's my way of attending yeah. to to my mind. And yeah. then I practice 30 at least 30 minutes of meditation. Mm -hmm. And that's my way of attending to my heart and kind of going deeper and mm -hmm. bringing some clarity and some ground. And so that three-pronged practice for me has been one of the most important transformational of my transformational experiences of my life, especially mm -hmm. as, um, like I said before, this idea that life can sometimes feel so overwhelming. I don't know where to start. Um, but if I've set up a, or, or even just the responsibility of my life, if I've set up a kind of rule of life that helps me maintain it, mm -hmm and have rhythms towards how I'm maintaining it rather than trying to do it all at once. Mm -hmm. I'm taking bite-sized chunks. This, this, especially this, this morally morning routine, I was a way for me to do that and kind of start with, like I said, locating some significance so that I know mm -hmm. I have a capacity here to go ahead and maintain, to, to get out the day, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that's a awesome practice. And, um, I know, um, I think uh, the fours and nines are have that uh, capacity for losing themselves and the vibrations of others around them and just being so open and porous that you know uh, too much uh, you know too much of people uh, can I know for myself I can just suddenly feel like where am I I'm God I'm I'm having a hard time locating my foot. <laughs> uh, because so like yourself exercise has been extremely important as a way of anchoring and having a felt sense of myself uh, i couldn't live without it and uh, and the meditation practice you know in the Guji fork there's a great emphasis on sensing the body in the meditation practice mm. as a way of uh, lining up all the three centers 
But it uh, sounds like you got something going great. And when you do the meditation, heart meditation, is there a particular practice you have? Or is it a variety of things over time? Um, I, uh, you know, very uh, strategically, I, I would I use, when I first started this morning routine, I started with meditation and I kept on falling asleep, mm -hmm. which is why I had to go to the gym first and then drink coffee. Yeah. Um, but still, some mornings it's just so difficult because it's very early. Um, mm -hmm. So I tend to use a lot of guided meditations. Yeah. So I'm hearing something still. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of space, but one of my favorites is um, I use a lot of Tara Brock meditations mm -hmm. yeah. and she leads through um you know more vipassana or mm -hmm. i love her kind of three um kind of step process where she does kind of the uh what is it arriving mm -hmm. anchoring and mm -hmm. opening yeah nice. yeah 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 great awesome yeah well i can imagine you know in my experience with nines is there they have a, a pretty great capacity for staying positive in the midst of things going crazy. Mm. And, uh, and it's a gift. And, and also, it can be an escape as all of our capacities are. Right. But uh, I you know, uh, having that being able to sort of conduct or, you know, that energy of laid back, easy going, it's safe here, you can relax. Uh, you know, you don't have to be anybody in particular, just be yourself. It is such a beautiful gift. Uh, and uh, I can imagine that you employ that quite regularly with four kids buzzing around. And and uh, uh, so so what, you know, say a little bit about your experience of that yeah. capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Um especially with the kids and even just you know, as I said before I was a pastor for a couple of years mm. um, uh, I'll say as well like through the whole like my whole life I've had multiple people introduce me as their best friend mm. and I'm like what I didn't know we were best friends I, and I'm like you, you actually don't even know much about me it's just that I'm such a great listener and I hold such quality space mm -hmm. that people feel naturally mm. seen even yeah. if I'm not actually super present, you know, I'm kind of <laughs> dropped out of the experience, but I hold space well, you know, yeah, and yeah. I've literally been introduced to someone's best friend and I was unaware that we were best friends, you know, That's great... so yeah, there definitely is that sort of even natural quality that I'm, that doesn't even, I'm, yeah, it's, it's definitely natural, but there is a, um, something that's always been so important to me is helping people feel completely and fully accepted. Yeah. Um, and I also think that is what, I, you know, I've had um, for as long as I can remember, people tell me things that, that they wouldn't normally tell other people. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, you know, it's an affect I kind of give off without sometimes trying, but it's uh, just a, a, a way of me, of being for me. And um, I think it helps me be, you know, I'm, there's a reason I'm drawn to these kind of vocations that I have been as a pastor and as as uh, someone that sits with people in their pain, hmm. their difficulty, and people feel they can naturally come to me and say things that they wouldn't, they've never said out loud before to others. Yeah. Um, and the funny thing about that is, we you know, we tend to give our gift, but not to ourselves. And um, um, that's like, that's the thing where I, I'm still practicing um, acceptance uh, toward myself in the ways that I, uh, you know, I'm so good at doing that for other people. But let me let me just also say, you said like sometimes um, this is quali quality of positivity or even kind of this reconciliation idea, um, a reconciling point maybe that that uh, we can have that I um, can overdo it to the point where this is too much, and so I shut it down actually too quickly mm. before there's actually any reconciliation here. Uh -huh. I'm, it's like an immediate. Let's just make it feel peaceful, even though we haven't done anything yet. <laughs> That's so, great. <laughs> yeah, so like even with my kids, who I'd probably feel the most safe with, right? Mm -hmm. um, they it can it can look a bit different than how it would with any with most other adults, where mm -hmm. um, there maybe there's a level of intensity that's happening here that I don't want to happen, and so I can actually shut it down 
mm-hmm. in a not in a way that I'm avoiding it or trying to get positive about it, but because I feel so safe with them, I can get like stop doing that because you're messing with my homeostasis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know? well, Whereas with other people, it wouldn't be in that way. I wouldn't actually be assertive about it, right? But right. it's a different it's a different expression of of how I'm trying to maintain some level of of uh, tranquility that you're you're messing with, right? <laughs> well, uh, as one one of my nine friends says, the bottom line is I don't want anybody to mess with my peace. Yeah. So if I have to do my Jedi trick of emitting peaceful energy into the room to quiet people down. I will do that. Yeah. Now that, that isn't necessarily in the service of real deep peace, but it's about right. taking care of my, uh, my uh, heart and soul. So, you know, I think it's, uh, it's like learning to know when, because I think that, that capacity to be, you know, and that wish to help people relax and settle and feel accepted. And, you know, I think nines can really transmit like the two is a kind of unconditional loving kindness mm. uh, towards people, and and uh, and there's so it's like I have to that just seems to be like uh, an innate part of their soul, you know, a real heart quality of just you know I want to bring uh, I want people to relax, settle, feel like it's safe here. They can tell their story. That mm. uh, you know it's like you're a safe harbor for people, which is reminds me of uh, you know Fred Rogers and uh, and. Yeah you know just just uh you know kind of a crown jewel of uh of the nine energy and and then noticing like all great qualities can be used to manipulate things to protect yourself right you know yes. what, what one of my teachers said all great spiritual truths can be used to lie extraordinarily well so you got to know the difference than when you're you know really giving something or when you're you know weaving some really spiritual bs uh mm. so i wonder absolutely yeah yeah so uh so how do you um uh, in terms of you know working with your beloved wife uh does she sometimes play the role of a one who re- waves a red flag when you're going into you know disassociation nine pattern or i mean do you have a, any kind of uh, communications around supporting <laughs> each other um yeah you know i mean it's we've we've been together married for 13 years this year mm. or this month actually oh i need to go get her something um, <laughs> um uh this month holy cow yeah um yeah so we we definitely have learned a lot of styles over the past you know initially um she we we are very she's a type one um mm-hmm. uh self-preservation mm. um and i remember uh I that's I am indifferent to anything that has to do with self-preservation. <laughs> like some of our earliest conflicts, I know this sounds strange, uh, and some people might judge me for this, but I didn't like showering when we first got married. I could go for long periods of time without it. <laughs> and for her, obviously, as a as a one, that's like this isn't okay, <laughs> and there's something wrong with this. And yeah, probably there is, but but you know, like initially that I felt more shamed into showering, you know, (laughs) Um, but, but yeah, no, we've learned a lot of valuable things around um, first off kind of, you know, one of the most, I think most valuable things the Enneagram can allow for is, is um, valuing diversity of perspective. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think where we first meet each other and recognizing just because you're doing it this way, doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, and so, you know, that helps us come not at each other, but to each other with some more sensitivity. Yeah. 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 And so um, I'm chuckling about your self press story because I've got <laughs> many. I uh, That particular zone, that particular uh, instinct is not yeah. my strongest, except yeah. getting to the gym and working out and all of that. But um yeah, that's definitely been a major new practice for me. So. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so, um, you know, type one, self-pres, my experience with them is they tend to, they have a passion for order and cleanliness and uh, aren't usually big fans of messes left untaken care of and 
but yeah. you know really really spot what needs to be done in, in the environment and there's a great passion for it and and uh so you know i always think of that dominant instinct as kind of a survival instinct when it's when that particular need isn't getting met you know people get really rattled and uh you know self press for one you know my uh, my husband isn't uh, showering. This could threaten my existence. I don't think we're yeah. going to be able to do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so it, it was bugging her on an instinctual level. It wasn't just. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Her uh, radar was going up. You know, the tribe may die because of this. Yeah. Um, so is is your dominant instinct uh, social? Is that the it one? It is. That, yeah. Yeah, because you're uh, quite, you know, quite gifted and articulate and, mm -hmm. you know, able to respond and go and flow with conversation, which is really, really oh, a beautiful thanks. quality. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that said, um, what do you think, um, when you think about, you know, let's say when you were in grade school or high school, what are, are are there things that you understand now about your type that would have would have been nice to know about when you were younger? You may not have been ready to hear it, but I mean, is, when you think about, oh, gee, if I was raising a type nine son or daughter, what would I want to attend to so they didn't necessarily have to go through some of the uh, suffering that I went through? Yeah. Hmm. Um. There is, um, this is something, it's a big thing I've, I've had to work on, and I'm, I'm definitely not through it by any means. Um, well, I'll, just with that in mind, I'll say, you know, I don't think our patterns ever go away, but I think our relationship with them is what can change. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wish that I knew that a long time ago, because mm -hmm. um, that would give me a little bit of hope instead of sort of this idea that at some point, if I just keep working hard enough, it'll stop, it'll go away, and I'll be enlightened, <laughs> whatever. Yes, yes. Um, but actually my quality of, of groundedness and, or, or, um, my window of tolerance might expand and I might be able to manage more, uh, just more adaptively, um, the thing, the circumstance, uh, is it Victor Frankl that says when your circumstance doesn't change, you must. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, so, but so back to like what I, some of maybe specific nineness as a kid or, I mean, I mean, one thing I definitely, I had a, one of the first loss, serious losses um, of, of death um, in my life. Um, I remember um, it was, it was my father-in-law and I remember, you know, managing, not knowing I was doing it, but remembering now managing the loss and the suffering for others, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm helping them feel helping them feel that and being with them and helping them feel seen and and hold and being a holding space for them to mm. you know and you know in that and i think that's kind of one of the aspects of like the social nineness is that i'm using myself uh what's valuable to me so i can focus on everybody mm -hmm. else's you know mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um in doing so i am not attending to certain emotions that are accumulative and so they're building and they're growing. And that means I have to push them down even harder and suppress them even more. And mm -hmm. so I'm actually losing energy and I'm losing the vitality of what it means to be present and actually continue to help be with people well. Mm. Um, and I remember it wasn't until a couple of days later after, the, after the, um, he had passed, we were at the funeral and all of a sudden I saw my own friends show up mm -hmm. and it actually, it actually brings up some emotion to me still mm -hmm. um, because it wasn't until my own friends showed up for me that that named I had pain too. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's okay. And I think that's a really good thing to name. Sometimes we're not able to locate what's important to us. And we need somebody else to mirror that back yeah. because yeah. I can get so lost in what other people, what's mm. valuable to them. Mm. Um, but their presence mirrored to me that I had my own wounds as well. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, that names a lot of my 
painful story of not feeling like truly seen as a kid mm -hmm. and in my own wounds. And, you know, there's, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with, uh, I'm sure you are, there's the concept of like a attachment, like a secure attachment. Mm -hmm. And I know Dan Siegel talks about the four S is safe, seen, soothed, and secure. And I love what he says about feeling seen. It's a quality of feeling felt in that my parents, my primary caregivers were mirroring back to me so that it would substantiate something in me. And I don't yeah. feel like I had much of that growing up. Yeah. And so now for me, that really happens. Uh, some of my closest people mirror back to me. They help me locate what's inside. Yeah. And I, awesome. I would just say that's really a, okay and a good thing for you to, to be able to find yourself in that way sometimes. And maybe even ask your closest people to help you do that as well. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that, that's awesome. I, I have the same experience uh, for myself that, you know, loving friends really helped me locate myself when I couldn't, you know, I, if I hadn't had them, it would have never happened. And uh, mm. so that's that's powerful. Um, and, and worth... Um, you know, um, my daughter is a type nine, and yeah. I didn't know the Enneagram when, when she was growing up, and she always seemed fine. She's always happy and joyful, and and then we learned when she hit about nineteen or twenty that you guys, you know, you didn't notice that I was really needing support, and yeah. I said, "You're right. I miss that completely. I, you look like you were just self-contained and." Go yeah, with the we flow. look great. You look great. You had <laughs> no need. Yeah. yeah, you were easy yeah. to take care of, and uh, yeah. and then your brother was just off the wall. So we were trying to work with him, and so that was really uh, that was a, a powerful uh, yeah. recognition for me. That I I, I, I just got, had another thought. If I could share it, yeah, yeah, yeah please um, do. Because this has been my my I have a not my nine year old, my oldest. I'm, we're pretty confident is very likely nine. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, you know, I would definitely caution against typing kids, but having the experience myself as a nine, I just, I, there's a lot there and I'm still holding it loosely, but there's a lot of proof. Anyway, um, one of the things that I, I wish would have happened for me that I'm trying to do for my own daughter now is, you know, there's this, there's this, um, it, and it's in a lot of materials, like your voice matters, right? Is the nine, the nines don't know their voice matters. It's, but it's not enough. It's not enough to tell a nine or your kid your voice matters. Because it's super easy for me to just go, thanks, whatever. That doesn't, that doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. You have to catch me doing something that's significant and call it out. Mm. Only someone that's significant could be doing that or think that way mm. or feel that or talk like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm doing something significant. My voice does matter. That's how I begin to experientially, experientially like embody that. By you again, this is where you help me see it in me. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and call it out and notice it and reflect it and yep. appreciate it and uh, that's that's a really uh, powerful teaching, really. Um, around, I know with my daughter. When I first started doing that, she would like, oh, no, that's not really true. I said, no, it is very, very true. And each time she would do something impactful, which she does a lot, uh, I, I would notice it and say something, say, that boy, that really moves me. You really, your kindness really touched me there. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that, over time, uh, seems to have brought her out forward with a lot more confidence and just, yeah. you know, I, I can make things happen here. So, yep. but that's a great... Uh, that should be one of in the parents' manuals for nines. That, that's, a, you know, not only for nines, for all kids, but that's really specifically very powerful for the nine. Yeah, yeah, because uh, my, my daughter, I would say in the past, she has struggled with confidence. And we've been trying to substantiate her significance in herself. And that's where the confidence has come from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. awesome. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to jump back to one of the things you said said that I, uh, I think is important reflecting, which is this idea uh, that we don't get rid of our patterns, right? And, and I remember my teacher saying to me, you, 
If you're trying to get rid of your patterns, you might as well give that up right now. They, they are like, they are immortal. So, <laughs> yes. and that's okay, since, because you've changed your relationship to them. You, maybe you spot them before they take you on a roller coaster ride, or maybe, you know, you don't identify quite as strongly, or maybe you apologize sooner, but you don't need to beat yourself up for the fact that these patterns just run. They're like a machine, and when you were a little guy, you didn't say, gee, I hope I have this type 4 envy pattern and then get mad at people who I'm comparing myself to. So you, it's just a pattern. And uh, yeah. and so I just wanted to, you know, sort of support that because I think that's really a powerful teaching uh, around the idea of uh, <laughs> enlightenment, that you get rid of all these patterns. And, right. and um, doesn't, as far as I know, it doesn't quite happen that way. So... Uh, yeah. 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 And I, yeah, and I think that's closer to what rea enlightenment is likely to yeah. be actually is when you realize um I can learn to operate not from within the emotionality the the activation of my emotions and so I'm reacting patternedly rather than I'm um I feel the emotion but I'm not getting caught up in it. I'm operating alongside my patterns yeah. but I have more space to for choice. Yeah. Yeah, I, there was uh, a little Irish saying that about feelings that instead of saying I'm feeling really sad, as I say, sadness is upon me right now, uh, uh, yeah. which is a little bit a little less identified with it. It's, it's just distance, upon, yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. upon me, kind of like the weather. Um, yeah, so. Um, the the nine, you know, the story we talk about that the nine, one direction is towards three, right? And becoming able to shine and radiate your significance and and feel your passion and go for it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it uh, sounds like you've done a lot of work with that. Uh, and, and that doesn't, you know, it's the idea to me that you start to sense that three energy and feel more a sense of your empowerment and your importance and your significance. And that actually, I think, allows that deeper quality of being the peacemaker, one who, uh, you know, helps people settle and feel safe, even come more alive and vibrant. If I'm so anyway, what, yeah. anything you want to say about that? Yeah. Um... Um, one of my practices um, that I've done, I, I, I will say, you know, I've, I've, I've been working for at least in different seasons of life a, a lot on this kind of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and this has been a long process. I, I'll say that first. Yeah. I think any real transformation is a process. Um, and is it, um, uh, it's the guy that wrote the book Atomic Habits. He said, we don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. Mm. So I've been practicing a specific system of change for a while. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, specifically even around like this, the, around threeness, um, you know, this value, this innate value and significance, um, that previously for me was a scary thing because even having any of that is what could, exactly what could cause something. Mm -hmm any level of disruption, mm -hmm. any kind of disruption, you know, mm -hmm. being, being a, a valuable person, you know, having an opinion, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, a, a, a large practice has been, um, in, in, uh, what's called an Ignatian spirituality, St. Ignatius of Loyola. Um, mm -hmm. he, he had this practice called a gear contra, which means to act against. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's it's sort of the idea of acting against what comes natural or comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. And in that process, you sort of practice into being what wasn't previously true. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Rohr says, we don't, we don't think ourselves in a new ways of living. We live ourselves in a new ways of thinking. Yeah. And so for me, uh, a lot of times uh, I have practiced what would it look like in this situation to embody being a significant person? And I'm going to sort of like why I think, I think it's really valuable. Like in, um, uh, more, more recent, uh, trauma work, uh, they talk about this quality of like dipping a toe in slowly and, and backing out. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And I would do that and I would make sure I was doing that in the same way, like taking care of myself. I'm going to be significant and and show up with a lot of significance. Mm -hmm. And this feels so uncomfortable. Okay, that was enough. I'm going to back up now. Mm -hmm. But I would do it slowly. And I would practice what does it look like to, I have a lot to say about this topic and I'm going to wow some people's socks off and this is going to be feel uncomfortable and then i'm going to take a break and then i'm just going to you know peace out for a little bit but in doing yeah. that that was me contributing my own voice yeah and that and over time that began to be easier and easier yeah well uh it, it's interesting you know that some of those principles show up in a 12-step work action uh, precedes understanding um uh fake it till you make it you know yeah. um be that person for as long as you can bear and then come back i think that's a really great you know lean into and then you can vacate when you need to uh, if it's yeah. too much uh right. great great principles of uh, change and uh yeah well it, it's interesting you know I, that book atomic habits is a, a super ener- energized type three book so uh, I think it's uh, great for, you know, uh, becoming more fully three. She has some great, beautiful ideas in there. Uh, so what is, uh, what's it like for you to be a dad? What's your experience of being a dad? Um, so um, it's, a, it's a lot of things. Uh, I, I think... You know, it's, I'd say it's the hardest thing I've ever done and the most rewarding thing I've ever done. It is both and. Some of my, um, as I said before, I have 48 children. And so they can be, I've been working on reframing the idea that they are not only an obstacle to what I'm trying to do right now. <laughs> they, they can be that, but they are also an invitation. Mm-hmm. I think behind most, if not all obstacles, is an invitation waiting for you to see it. And so um, I think, like I said before, my kids are my greatest teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, they sort of continually, without without saying it, are asking me to embody myself and to show up in a way that I don't know if I would just do for myself Mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. But they they call out in me a capacity to show up to be a dad because Mm -hmm. my dad was great, but he, he was lacking in a lot of ways as well. And he didn't show up for me in a lot of ways. And I I still love my dad, but I want to build on that. And I want to show up for my kids more than what I was shown up for. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I, I just think, um, what it means for me, what it means to be a dad as a, as a nine is, is my kids continually, um, are invitations to uh, see what it means to deeply participate. Um, every day is as long as I'm up for it, and I, I'm not always. But I mean, that's the thing, though. They're little kids. I have to always be up for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thankfully, I have a partner in crime to, to help me with, to help yeah. to assist with that. But, but yeah, you know, it is this invitation every single day. Um, how can I show up today? What does it mean to, to, to become that guy that my kids need? Um, yeah. 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 Well, you are, uh, what are the ages of your kids right now? Um, nine is the only, and she's the only girl. Um, and I have a six year old, a three year old and a one year old. So you're, you're in the foxhole. I mean, this is, uh, <laughs> this is, uh, the most in, pressurized uh, time I think uh, at least yeah. that was in my experience it was it's like do I have a life a uh, well <laughs> I know I know I, I have one but I, I'm not going to get to express it the way I think I would like to today because there's these living beings who need my attention and want my attention and uh, yeah so that was uh, and and I'm so grateful for that experience because it, it taught me so much about myself and just about what I care about, but it was it was hard, um, you know, yeah. getting time to, you know, go off on any kind of, you know, creative jag uh, was hard to make that time. And and uh, yep. some yep. types are more adapted uh, to that. Type twos are often can be pretty 
easy sure. going. Like, that's just my life. This is great. So, right. Yeah. I mean, I had a, a bit of a, since high school, I've been very intrigued by um, the Desert Fathers, mm -hmm. the, the, the Christian monastics originally. Mm -hmm. um, so, when I was seriously toying with the idea of what could it look like to become a monk at, at one point. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and anyway, obviously it didn't work out, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm still very drawn to that idea of what, like the, the monastic style of living and, and, you know, sort of your whole life is a practice. And so one of my favorite books as a, as a parent actually is from a guy named Ronald Rollheiser and it's called the domestic monastery. Oh, Cool. And so, yeah, so it's this approach that you don't have to go off into, I mean, I, I know this is kind of even some Gurdjieffian thought too. Like oh, yeah. This is, this is how do you practice what it means to be a monk in real life? You yeah. can do that. You actually can do that. You're all of your, I mean, that's what I mean really by like all of your, my ob obstacles are invitations. What is yeah. this teaching me right yeah. now? Yeah. 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 Uh, in the Gurdjieff work, the, there's the orientation towards, um, the more troublesome the people are around you, the better, because you get to have all of your patterns triggered uh, in more intense yeah. live time, so you can't go yeah. escape and uh, and uh, so. Yeah, how do you work with that part of you if you don't let it be? Yeah, activated? if you don't have yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If uh, and you know, kids are quite activating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they have an intuitive sense of where the buttons are, and they just like I must press this. Oh, look, Dad just jumped. Uh, I better press it again, see what happens. And it's just uh, so that yep, that's what they do. And uh, yeah, it's quite a blessing, and and it's good to have a, a partner that's uh, you know with you. And so when you get crazy, you can take a break and yeah, uh, so make yeah. sure I shower. Yeah. <laughs> At least once a week. I mean, I I can go. My wife will say, it's been four or five days. And I, have you smelled yourself lately? I, said, I smell great. No, you don't. So uh, I have uh, a... We have something in common. Absolutely. And I'm not against showering. I just like, yeah, yeah whatever. Yeah. It's good. It doesn't I'm come good. to mind, right? Yeah, yeah, right. No problem here. So, well... um. Anything else you'd like to add in terms of your journey? What's been supportive for you that, you know, that you would like to remark on or, um, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, one of my, I, I, I read a lot. And so I think in quotes and one of my, favorite quotes about transformation is a guy named Murray Stein, mm -hmm. who um, he says, transformation um, is not about getting something you didn't previously had. It's about tapping into latent qualities that are already there. Yeah. And I would say to any nine listening, you have what it takes to live a, a fully embodied life. Mm. You already have what it takes. It's it's uh it's but it's it's within you and it's, it's in you yeah yeah and it's a for me. It's been about the idea that reality has sort of set up that we are healed by our wounds when we share them, mm -hmm. and there is a quality of ambition and uh, and energy and. Uh, motivation um, in feeling the thing I don't want to feel. And that's where I'm going to look for, or that's where I'm going to locate um, uh, even the space to not keep losing myself. Because that, as much as it's easy to do that, no nine likes saying yes out here and when they mean no inside. Yeah. It is at some point in time, it becomes so aggravating and shameful and, and I'm I'm so frustrated that I, I just did it again. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that means you're angry. <laughs> you are angry. <laughs> you are angry, whether you realize it or not. Um, yeah. And the more you suppress that, the less energy you're going to have to keep to show up in the world. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. So 
find that aspect in you, in you and sometimes it, I would say it has to do with getting inhabiting your body. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, beautiful teaching on the nine. Thank you. Thank you, really a pleasure to hear about your journey and just uh, the depth of it and the, you know, the subtleties uh, just really uh, can feel, you know, the investigative zeal you bring to looking at yeah. things and understanding them, which is really beautiful. So, yeah, uh, yeah thank you so much. Really. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for having me, man. Very grateful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, many blessings to you. And I'll turn off the recording here and then we can uh, uh, maybe debrief it. Now, if I lose you,